as you'll see now, we are, we are now recording this session. Uh, the reason for this is that, so that we can have um, a, a, a video uh, recorded version uh, of this training webinar that we can post uh, online for those who are unable to attend one of the live sessions. Um, also, you'll see that I have, um, I've muted uh, your lines. Um, you can unmute your own line um, by clicking on the microphone button to the right of your name. Um, and uh, our facilitator, uh, Christina, uh, may uh, have occasion uh, to, um, to ask for, for questions um, or, um, or ask you to unmute your lines at, at various times. Um, also, questions can be typed into the chat window, um, and, uh, and we will try to address those at the appropriate time. Um, so I'm going to pass it to Christina Chapman, who is our facilitator for today's training. Christina? Good morning, everyone. Um, so my name is Christina Chapman. I'm a disaster program specialist with the Indiana region. I'm located in West Central Indiana. I've been with Red Cross for 20 years. Uh, my background, I started um, in what's now known as PHSS, uh, teaching lots of CPR and first aid classes. Um, and I've been in disaster services since 2004. And then, of course, when they uh, made the, the shift to the disaster program area um, back in 2013, I shifted to be a disaster program specialist. So I'm happy to have you guys here. Here today. Um, as far as in disasters capacities, um, I've served um, a little bit in some logistics roles. Usually I'm a site director or um, I've been um, AD of operations um, a couple times um, within the region. Um, so we're going to get started today doing logistics and overview. Um, so the things I wanted to talk to you about is uh, this course, of course, is an abbreviated class. Um, it's going to take about an hour to run through. It is not going to provide technical details about how to accomplish um, the tasks within logistics. Um, we are going to try to be as interactive as possible. Um, so you can um, either, um, at the times, you can uh, unmute your phone and ask, feel free to ask questions. Um, and we're going to do some questions um, through the chat box as well. Um, just to make sure everyone's still uh, still paying attention and listening. Um, so the first thing is, is I would like for everyone, uh, for Richard and Rose, if you guys could type into the chat box um, what regions you're from. So we just kind of get an idea as to what um, regions are joining us today. And while you're doing that, I just want to remind you that, of course, the Red Cross uses a lot of acronyms. So if you hear any that are unfamiliar to you, um, please just um, say something, um, or you can raise your hand or put something in the chat and say, you know, what does this mean? And I'll be happy to, uh, to go back and to cover that. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started here. There we go. Okay, so our purpose today is to provide just again that basic operational overview um, about the logistics group and how the um, logistics supports the American Red Cross Disaster Relief Operations and DRO. Um, that is what we call of our operations when it's uh, bigger than, and then, you know, a single family fire or, you know, a couple multi-unit fires. Um, we're going to call it Disaster Relief Operation or DRO. So again, we're going to give you an overview. After taking this course, you should have a good idea about which logistics activities you want to learn more about and possibly which ones you'd like to be involved in. Our learning objectives today is we're going to explain um, how lo the logistics group supports um, our DRO, describe each of the activities and the functions in the, within the logistics group, and explain how logistics um, really provides a lot of the backbone for all the other groups and activities um, within disaster services. So um, again, as I said, if you could type into the type box uh, or the chat box um, your name, um, where you're from, and then um, um, if you'd like to go ahead and include also what skills and abilities do you need to be a, log a logistics worker within the organization. If you're familiar with that, what do you think that you would need to do as a logistics worker? And Christina, uh, we do have a couple of answers in there. Uh, so just a reminder for Richard and Rose, um, when you type in the chat, please um, please send it to everyone uh, so that uh, Christina can also see it. So uh, Richard is Colorado, Wyoming region. Um, and Rose says um, uh, Blue Sky DPM National Capital Region Training Manager. Um, 
or maybe I maybe I should be Blue Sky DPM National Capital Region and training manager for DRO HQ for um, 397. Awesome. Great. Well, welcome to both of you. I love uh, the National Capital Region there, and um, I love Colorado. I just was out there last summer. So great. Welcome to both of you. Um, so the next thing um, – then is of course, let's talk about what the logistics group does. The logistics activities um, that we're going to talk about today. Um, so logistics is a group within disaster services made up of seven different activities. Um, so these are facilities, transportation, supply, procurement, warehousing, in-kind donation, and then Life Safety and Asset Protection, otherwise known as LSAP. So these are all um, what make up our logistics function, and some folks don't realize that all of those um, different activities are involved in this. So what, what is logistics? Uh, logistics, obviously, if you think about it, they, they're going to take care of a lot of different things, but what, what's the goal of the responsibilities of the logistics group? The responsibilities are to provide transportation, facilities, supplies, equipment on a DRO, and to ensure the safety and security of all activities so that workers can focus on service delivery. One of the things I'm going to um, you know, suggest to you is I know within our region, we try to do some of the logistics functions as far as having our volunteers assigned to do these, even during our blue skies, um, and, and just even simple things like we use requisition forms when we're getting supplies for like a home fire campaign. Um, the biggest thing with logistics is um, logistics volunteers are expected to adhere to um, a set of values. Um, and so let's talk about all the different functions. And so the first thing we're going to talk about is facilities. So for the facilities group, it's the responsibility of workers in facilities to acquire, inspect, and equip the facilities used by the American Red Cross. This um, responsibility involves completing forms, agreements, and other documents um, is also required. Although the key, of course, is ensuring this process goes smoothly is to having the appropriate paperwork completed correctly so it can be approved in a timely manner. Um, this course is not going to cover what forms that we use or how to complete them. It's going to provide an overview. So um, some facilities, just like here in the pictures, that we could use on a disaster relief operation is um, kit, um, shelters, kitchens, our headquarters operations center, warehouses, sites for emergency aid stations, facilities, space needed to provide service delivery. So if you look at these different pictures, as you can see, there's lots of different facilities that we're going to use. Um, and like I said, the biggest thing is, is to make sure that we're completing the forms correctly. Um, the last thing you want to do is have to go back later um, and try to do those agreements. You want to make sure that those are done before Red Cross ever um, takes up residence in a building. And that's, of course, for many different reasons. Okay, some of the types of facilities, um, like I said, shelters, kitchens, um, feeding sites, service delivery sites, emergency aid stations, and warehouses. Okay, so within the chat box, um, what are there any other types of facilities you guys can think of that we might use um, within an operation? Okay, we'll go ahead and go on to transportation. Um, transportation, as you can see in the pictures, of course, our emergency response vehicle. Uh, we need lots of vehicles uh, when we have an operation going. So the vehicles are needed for transporting items for clients, transporting freight to disaster sites, and for moving workers from one area to another. Um, so the purpose of the vehicle, of course, pictured the emergency response vehicle is called an ERV. Um, we use this for feeding and sometimes distribution of bulk items um, like comfort kits. Um, we also will use box trucks for bulk distribution items, um, passenger vans for shuttles for getting volunteers back and forth between um, like the staff shelter to their work assignment, and then rental cars. So within the transportation unit, um, this, is a, this is a very involved um, 
responsibility. Um, when you work in transportation, you have to be able to track the rented, loaned, and donated vehicles. We have to maintain and track the national vehicles. Um, sometimes it involves things like arranging courier, mail, and shuttle services. Recording and reporting all vehicle accidents, and yes, we have those on operations. Um, completing daily reports of vehicle counts and associated costs. If you've been on a DRO before, um, you've probably been chased down by a transportation person at some point wanting to know um, if you have a keys to the vehicle or what vehicle you have or um, you know how you're getting to and from um, different locations. There is a group called the National Fleet Operations that maintains our Red Cross vehicles, NFO, um, and that is something if you're interested in to make sure that you talk to your region about. I know, um, I think like in our, our region, Indiana, I think we have one of those um, that actually can, can manage that. So that is something that's definitely high in demand. Um, this group is always interested in people. If you have auto mechanical skills to join that team. Um, so again, let your chapter or region know if you're interested in something like that. Supply. Supply is the gatekeeper of the requisition process, which we're going to get into in here in just a moment. Um, they provide the conduit for gathering and distributing supplies to a disaster relief operation. Supply is responsible for that disaster requisition form, the 6409, used to be known as Greenies if you've been around for a while. Um, disaster requisitions are used to request and track all items or services, expendable and non-expendable items that are either purchased rented, leased, loaned, or donated. When, um, when you need supplies, if you need a pen, note pad, tables, blankets, copiers, vehicles, um, radios, anything that you need, all of those must be put on a 6409, and then the supply workers then decide how to resource it. Um, sometimes they might, may look and say that they already have these things in our warehouse, um, like cots, blankets, rakes, or shovels, or something may need to be purchased locally, like a pallet jack, office supplies, paper goods. There could be a national contract involved, such as food products vendor or an auto leasing company, or it might be available through a donation. For example, um, in-kind donations often get um, offers for bottles of water or bleach. Um, In-kind donations, of course, are helpful because they help reduce our operating expenses, um, and it's the same procedure that goes through that. So let's talk about expendable and non-expendable items. Um, so if you'd like to either take yourself off of mute or you can use the chat and send it to everyone, um, what are some expendable items that we would use on an operation? What are expendable items? And I just unmuted the line. Perfect. Uh, could it be, be like food or supplies? Absolutely. Absolutely, food and supplies. Thanks for uh, chiming in there. Anything else? Okay, so um, expendable supplies could also be things like comfort kits, cleanup kits, things like that. How about um, some non-expendable supplies? The non-expendable items are things that have a life after the operation, or at least we hope they have a life after the operation. So what are some things that are non-expendable that we can talk about? What about office items like computers? Absolutely, computers, great answer, thank you. Vehicles? Vehicles, yes, we hope they survive the operations. Phones? Phones, okay. Cambros, things like that. Um, so yeah, so those are all non-expendable items. Thanks everyone for chiming in, I really appreciate that. Kind of helps make the course a little bit more interactive rather than just listening to me. Okay, um, while we have the lines open, are there any questions before we go on to talk about the 6409? Okay, 
Hearing none, we'll keep moving on. Um, so the next thing we're going to talk about is if you're looking at your screen, um, we're looking at slide number 12. Um, and this is the disaster requisition form, otherwise known as a 6409. Um, so we're going to talk a lot about this form, um, just to help hopefully clear up any confusion on it. So this form has three parts, um, what we call the three-way match. So the first page has the request and the required approval signatures. The second page, um, otherwise known as the 6409B, is the disaster receipt. It's the proof of receipt that the product has been delivered to the requester. And then the third page or part C is the bill of lading, um, 6409-C. It is filled out by the entity that is shipping the goods or services. A packing receipt or invoice can substitute for part C of the 6409. So once delivery is made, the paperwork is returned to supply to reconcile using a three-way match process, which means checking for the approved requisition document, a signed receipt document, and invoice document. So let's look at how this kind of comes into play. So if you look at this slide now that's up on your screen, so um, let's talk about this. So where do 6409s come from? 6409s are going to come from anybody and everybody on the operation. This is going to come from your sheltering manager, um, your um, health services supervisor, or, or um, anyone on the operation. It can come from an, from an SA, a service associate. It can come from anybody. So if you are working, let's just give this example. So you're working at a shelter and, um, and you're a service associate, so you're, you're walking around to make sure everyone's doing okay. And as you're walking around, you notice that you're low on snacks at the snack table. And you go to the back room where you know the snacks are at, and you notice that there's only two more boxes of snacks and there's 50 people in your shelter, and you maybe only have 20 more snacks. So obviously you're going to get low on snacks here pretty quickly. And you also notice at the same time that we've run out of sticky notes um, and post-it notes. And of course, we know that we can't run an operation without those, right? Um, so you're going to fill out a 6409 for these items. Um, so you're going to then bring it to your supervisor who will then sign off on it and approve that, that yes, we need these items. And then these all go to supply. As you can see the funnel there, they all go to the supply. Supply then is going to make sure um, that, you know, once these items are, are approved as far as um, um, you, you've submitted the request and you've had someone sign off on them. They are then going to figure out the best way to procure these supplies. So they're going to work um, with retail stores, uh, or they may send it over to procurement who may work with retail stores or vendors to purchase the items or rental companies to secure the equipment. Um, and then, of course, they're going to work with facilities to locate buildings, um, if it's a building that you're asking for. Um, they may send it to in-kind donations where they're going to solicit donations from known contributors such as like Home Depot to seek out new donors for items such as water, bleach, or shovels. Um, the items may be located in a disaster uh, or a Red Cross warehouse called the Disaster Supply Field Center or DSFC. They may have, may have those items in stock. Typically they're going to have cots, blankets, tables, chairs, technology equipment, cleanup kits that can be quickly shipped to wherever you are. Um, they may also send it to National Headquarters Logistics staff in Washington, D.C. They may then activate national contracts or locate large vendors, partners, or government agencies to help secure food, supplies, and equipment needed for the operation. They're going to, of course, work closely with shared services and disaster finance to leverage the best financial opportunities. So we're going to look a little bit more at procurement now. So as we mentioned before, um, as we mentioned before in the previous slide, procurement is responsible for obtaining and replacing supplies through donations, loans, rentals, or purchases. Um, they may also acquire services needed for the disaster relief operation like janitorial, dumpster, or security. It only takes working a shelter for a day to realize that you're going to have to have a dumpster there on site to make sure that you're moving um, all of the waste and all the trash off the site. Procurement is going to work with the Life Safety and Asset Protection or LSAP to provide security. Procurement is also going to work with folks like in-kind donations for assistance in fulfilling requested items. Procurement is also responsible for retrieving and returning remaining items and supplies from the relief operation and returning it to wherever it goes. Um, it maintains the paperwork, receipts, and invoices to submit to supply for completion of the three-way match process. 
um, after an operation, sometimes, um, you know, we, a lot of folks will leave operations, you know, near the end. And um, logistics is usually one of the last groups to leave because they have to make sure that, you know, if that copier that we borrowed uh, from Conoco Minolta gets back to where it's supposed to go. So the next thing to talk about is warehouses. So uh, warehouses, when we have large quantities of items that need to be temporarily stored, the Red Cross is, of course, going to open warehouses. Earlier in the course, we talked about what the needs were for a warehouse facility. Items in the warehouse are usually palletized cases of cleanup kits, bleach, cots, food items, snacks, and water that are shipped in by vendors uh, or from national disaster warehouses. Warehouses um, are uh, our distribution centers. Warehouse workers uh, check the Form 6409 for accuracy and appropriate approvals before distributing. So again, so let's just talk back to the snacks uh, situation we talked about earlier. We need more snacks in our shelter. So we've turned in the 6409 um, and then supply is going to um, send that into the warehouse and the warehouse is then going to um, um, say that, yep, you know, we've got, you know, uh, uh, three pallets of snacks, so then those are going to get brought over to the shelter and then, you know, you're going to sign off on, on it when it comes to the shelter. One of the biggest things with warehousing is, of course, uh, making sure that you definitely have an attention to detail. Um, inventory management is very critical. Um, we're managing lots of supplies, so you definitely have to make sure that you like to do um, attention to detail work if you're going to be working in a warehouse. Um, a lot of our bulk distribution items, those are often staged at our warehouses and then can be moved um, like the day of into trucks or herbs or however we're going to be getting those things out to folks. So I mentioned earlier that we could briefly um, discuss in-kind donations. The reason that in-kind donations is managed by the corporation's development or fundraising department, it works operationally with our logistics group. Often companies want to donate goods to the American Red Cross, so in-kind donation workers are going to determine if the items offered are appropriate and if they can be used for the current disaster response. In-kind donations is responsible for acquiring supplies and materials needed on a relief operation without cost to the operation, and this, of course, is so crucial because it helps guard that donated dollar by defraying some of the cost of the operations. Workers in in-kind donations report the dollar value of donations received daily on the daily report and keep records of the donors and resources for the chapter's future use. After the operation, of course, is over, we're going to be lots, sending lots of thank you cards, right? And so we want to make sure that we have everything properly documented so that we can send all those thank you letters to folks. If you'd like to learn more about this activity, make sure you speak to your chapter disaster director about further, further training in this. So in-kind donations, again, is going to help a lot um, to make sure that we help offset our costs. And sometimes, you know, we're going to get calls from folks and, and maybe they don't have something big to donate, but other times I know just sitting in my chapter in Indiana, um, we had a call last week from a corporation that had two semi-trucks um, of water, and not only did they want to donate the water, but they were willing to drive them to wherever we needed to go. So, you know, sometimes those quick phone calls can turn into amazing relationships. Looking at life safety and asset protection, or otherwise known, of course, as LSAP, um, they're responsible for the safety of all Red Cross assets, both material and human. LSAP workers are going to visit the facilities that the Red Cross uses to make safety inspections and recommendations for safety improvement. Sometimes LSAP may manage traffic control at the disaster relief operations headquarters. Um, they will also serve as liaisons with local, state, and federal law enforcement agencies. A lot of our LSAP workers have background in law enforcement, security, or military. So we've talked all about the activities within the logistics group. Before we move on um, to the last section, what kind of questions do you have? If you could uh, type those in the chat window or if, uh, um, if we could go off mute and see what kind of questions we have. I have a question regarding warehouse items. Okay, great. Often, often we'll order much more than we need. How do we mm -hmm. ensure that it gets returned back to the proper people or location? That's a great question. Um, 
as operations are, are winding down, um, that is one of the most important things is making sure that, of course, we don't leave things or, le or let anything go to waste. So the biggest thing is going to be to make sure that um, the donations as they come in or the orders, um, to make sure that we have, first of all, just a track of where, where these items came from. And once you know that, then you can reach back out to that donor or that company. Um, you know, let's just say that we've ordered, I don't know, five pallets of toilet paper, and we still have three pallets left, and we got it from um, our local our Sam's Club. First, we're going to contact them and say, you know, first of all, will you take this back? Will you, you know, take this back as a return um, and, and see if then they can give us a credit on that? If they aren't going to be able to do that or whatever organization can't, then we would want to make sure that we reach out to see, um, like in this situation right now where we've got multiple operations going on, um, maybe it can be transferred to another location. I know we had that last um, fall. We had a, a level four here in Indiana at the same time the big operation was going down in Louisiana. So everything that we had here that we couldn't just quickly either return or, or if we had a really small amount, everything else was loaded up into a semi truck and sent down to Louisiana, you know, um, and, and things like that, you know, we may just be able to, to um, store and until the next disaster. But of course, if we have 20 pallets of toilet paper, we don't want to you know, be storing that type of thing unless we have something like this going on right now. Um, so that's going to be the thing. And then you know, if you we're not able to return it or we're not able to repurpose it within the organization, um, then it's going to be figuring out you know, who else could benefit from it. Um, so maybe we donate it to another, you know, organization. There's just there's lots of different variables there. Um, but that is one thing if you're working in the supply and the warehousing, you're going to be working really closely to make sure that you get everything back. Thanks for that question. Any other questions? Okay, moving on then. Okay, so talking about our logistics review. Um, so the question is, who are the customers of the logistics group? And the answer is everybody. Everyone on our disaster relief operation is a customer of logistics. So logistics is going to work very closely with every single department, every single volunteer within the organization. Um, so when you think about all the different things, logistics is a support group. They're responsible for ensuring that all other groups and activities have all the tools necessary to provide quality, cost-effective service to those affected by the disaster just as soon as we possibly can. So we do that, of course, again, through our seven different areas of facilities, transportation, supply, procurement, warehousing, in-kind donations, and life safety and asset protection. Some of the key things I want you to remember from this uh, presentation is, of course, logistics has a major role in acquiring, tracking, and returning all the equipment and supplies needed on an operation. Logistics is responsible for being a good steward of that donated dollar. And logistics is responsible for keeping an accurate records of the goods and services for the operation. So the next step here is, um, after this presentation today, um, to think about if you want to be involved in logistics, um, make sure you're working with your chapter disaster leadership. Maybe it's your DPS, your DPM, your disaster workforce engagement manager. Um, work with the folks within your chapter and your region um, if you're interested in continuing on within logistics. The full length courses are logistics and overview, logistics supply, in kind donations on a DRO and forklift fundamentals courses that can talk to you um, a lot more in depth about the different areas of logistics and how you can help and you can plug in. So what other questions do we have here as we're wrapping things up? Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to let our um, coordinator here take back over. Hi, okay. Uh, well, thanks, folks. Um, really appreciate your time today and, and, um, uh, and for Christina, her time um, as our instructor today. 
Um, so uh, if you do have any additional questions, uh, like I said, we're, we're going to be posting uh, a recorded version of this uh, webinar online. Um, and we, we also have several other offerings uh, coming up in the next two weeks if you want to join any of the future ones. So uh, with that, uh, thanks, everyone. I uh, hope you have a wonderful day. Take care. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.